Hello and welcome back to P7. That's one of my favorite exams that I took in ACCA and still love it. Still really admire this paper. It's amazing. It's you know, really cool. And uh, as you might recall, we're coming towards something more easy and something that's uh, fun to talk about, right? That is professional and we're a professional and ethical consideration. So we'll be talking about code of ethics today. As you might recall, we have already done international regulatory frameworks, money laundering, and laws and regulations in section A of the syllabus. So today we'll be talking more about the code of ethics. So without any further hesitation, let's move on and talk about fundamental principles. Now ACCA have five fundamental principles. Now I'll give you some examples with it. I know you guys know it because you have studied this before in so many different papers in FA, P1, P3, and many other papers. But like I said, we'll be talking, I'll just give you a brief introduction about what these things are and how these things really matter in the exam as well, okay? This is a very important and very easy part of the syllabus. So if you know how you're going to do the exam papers with this type of a question, life will become a lot more easier for you. How will it become easier? Is by the fact that you are going to answer this very correctly. You know these things, it's very simple. And, and it's awesome in that way. Now let's talk about, okay, it doesn't come, does it come? No, I can't unzoom it. I can zoom it, but I can't unzoom it. So I can make it smaller. But anyway, the first thing is integrity, objectivity, professional competence, and due care, confidentiality, and professional behavior. I refuse to remember it as P-I-C-O-P. That's pickup. I actually it doesn't exist. The word actually does not exist in English language, but it's a very nice mnemonic. It sounds very cool. Pick up. What's pick up? P I C O P professional competence and due care. I for integrity, C for confidentiality, O for objectivity, and P for professional behavior. So P I C O P is pick up. That's my mnemonic. If you guys want to follow on with that, if you think it helped you in the exam, go ahead. I gave you one mnemonic to remember. Okay? Now, let's talk about integrity. Integrity doesn't just mean to be honest. Being honest is a very cool thing, but let's say you're honest, but you're not very straightforward. You'll just twist the words, you'll say something just to please people, where you won't lie, but you won't tell the truth either. Telling half lies, you know, that kind of a thing, telling half the truth. Uh, that actually does not count as integrity. You need to person have this integrity in them, they need to be very honest and need to be very straightforward. If you don't like someone, say it on the face, something like that, okay? Being in, having this integrity is really a good thing. Now, I'll give you an example that goes back many, many years ago. One of the audit partners in London from, or from KPMG, I'm not disclosing any names here. Or to be honest, I forgot the name, but uh, it's a true story. So you'll, I, I find it very amazing to tell people about this. <clears throat> but actually, you know what, I'm going to skip the story to professional behavior. It sounds more professional behavior kind of thing. Integrity is more about being honest. So, okay, let's say you went to a shopping complex. <clears throat> you purchase some chocolates from there. I, 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 I know I give a lot of chocolate, chocolate examples. It's just that I'm trying not to eat a lot of chocolates and I love chocolates. So I'm having a bit of a problem there. So, you know, I'm obsessed with them. But integrity is basically that when you go to the supermarket, you buy some chocolates and when you when you're buying some chocolate they give you some they give you the change back let's say you give them 100 bucks and the chocolate cost is 10 they give you 92 they give you two dollars extra all right just just for the sake of argument we say that this happens now you have to be very straightforward and honest right that's the that's a sign of having integrity into yourself but let's say you didn't know that you were and you're an honest person you normally wouldn't do that but let's say you just got in the car and then you realize you got two extra dollars in your pocket and you're just smile and say okay that's nice nobody knew about it people still think you're honest but is it okay to do that no that's not integrity you need to be straightforward and honest so go back give the two dollars back to that person okay talking about objectivity now, objectivity is basically no bias or conflict of interest influencing your business judgments. Uh, it, this actually means that you need to be very, very strict with yourself. In effect, that nothing changes your decision. 
I, I like to give an example in a way that let's say a person is pointing gun to your forehead. He's going to kill you. I want to go to something very gory, but I'd rather not. But he's going to kill you. He's going to put a bullet in your head, throw your brains out, you know, all over the wall. It becomes, yeah, it's, it's bad, right? Will you change your decision? Actually, you won't. You really wouldn't. That's objectivity. So to be objective, you need to make sure nothing outside that circle of your objectivity, of what your decision is going to be, it, let's say you make a decision that you need to tell the management there's fraud going on in the company, in the payroll, for example. Very common these days. But what do you think they would do? Would they take it seriously? Would they threaten you? A lot of people today are afraid to whistleblow. That's the reason there's deep web. I think I've explained to you guys about deep web. If I haven't, uh, do let me know. I'll just, uh, you know top it up in the next lecture sometime. Deep Web is a very, very amazing part of internet, a very dirty part of internet, a, a very dark part of internet. It's called dark web for a reason. Deep or dark web, whatever it is. It's not accessible by Google. There's a special software for it, but it's really amazing. I'm not sure which lecture I said it in, but I, I've explained it a little bit, but if you guys want to know more about it, I'll tell you about it. But in the Deep Web, there's a section uh, where people go to whistleblow. So if you're working in Microsoft, for example, and you find something going on there, you're very afraid something bad is going to happen to you. So what do you do? You don't say it. You don't go public about it. But you go anonymous. Deep Web is anonymous. You can't, people can't track you down. Whatever you do on there, people can never track you down. Well, almost never. Unless you're very stupid, then they'll catch you. So that's objectivity. So people go there uh, and post stuff online to whistleblow okay but objectivity basically means that you don't change your decision just because something is influencing you so don't get influenced all right now talking about professional competence in due care now professional competence is basically being competent to do the work that you're supposed to do now that actually means going to st attending seminars, studying properly with it and stuff like that, doing things that makes you competent to do the job, makes you up to date of whatever is going in the market. There was a new IFRS 16, IFRS 15 that came out. If you don't know about it, that's one of the reasons is that you are not professional, professionally competent, right? You need to be professionally competent. For Yeah, okay, I think I explained it very well. Uh, Deal care is basically just making sure whatever work that you do and all your skills are perfectly well and they are taken care of perfectly. So that due care, for example, the due care uh, applies to a doctor is to take care of his patient. Uh, there was this news just came a couple of days ago, a person in Singapore, a woman in Singapore, uh, the doctors forgot to take one of the needles out of her stomach. That sounds really weird, you know, and it sounds scary. So that's kind of the thing that they're not acting on due care. So yeah, let's talk about confidentiality, okay? I'm sorry, I got uh, I got really distracted with the word groovy baby. I was wondering what actually that is. In the exam questions, you may have to apply these to a case study. Groovy baby. Okay, what is groovy baby? I don't know what groovy baby is. Seriously, I'm in the same wavelength as you are over here. Okay, confidentiality. Confidentiality is to make sure that you do not disclose any uh, unwanted things that your client doesn't want you to be disclosing. For example, Apple came up with a new iPhone that's coming on 12th of September, right? Now, it's an amazing phone. As you guys know, Apple is very famous for having a button at the bottom of their phone. That's the only button that's accessible that's called the home button. It's more, it has a fingerprint on it. It's really nice. It looks very... It looks different from everything else. Like everyone tried to make it. There's this Chinese company called Mizu. They tried to make something similar, but they couldn't get very close to it. Huawei came very close with their P10 series to make that button. But, you know, iPhone still had the edge. But to this time, iPhone removed that button. So iPhone 8 or whatever they're going to call it, iPhone 7S or 7 8 or I don't know, that's coming without a button. It, there's no home button. 
it's going to be all screen, 100% screen, and they're going to be in, but they're going to be a button that's a soft key. So you just put your thumb, like, let's say that's the fingerprint. You just put your thumb on the screen and the screen will turn on by itself. And that sounds really cool. Like I really would want to be the one of those persons who get the iPhone 8 as soon as it comes out. But for example, let's say they, they took, it took them a very long time to came up with this technology. If I brought it up actually is because of that. One of the employees didn't do that. They, they went to Microsoft or they went to Samsung, for example, their main competitor, to told them that that's what they're going to do. Dude, you guys are making Note 8 right now. Why don't you put the same technology over there? Note 8 sucks. You know, look at the design. It looks ugly. They could have done that, but they didn't because of confidentiality. I'll give you an ex another example that happened a long time ago, a very long time ago, in a, a few decades ago. Um, as you guys know, a lot of people say that. Uh, I personally believe the same thing. Coca-Cola is better than Pepsi. Okay, fine. I don't, don't no need to argue with me. If you find Pepsi better, suit yourself. I personally prefer Coca-Cola. I personally prefer Coca-Cola with a vanilla flavor. Like a lot of people say it sound, it tastes bad or something. I, I love it. I love vanilla flavor Coca-Cola. It's really nice. Although I'm not drinking it too much because of the, all the caffeine and sugar inside of it. But still, you know, once in a while it tastes really good. But what happened one time is that one of the employees working in the Coca-Cola industry in the United States uh, took the formula to make the Coca-Cola, okay, and they went to Pepsi headquarters. They went, they disguised themselves as one of very shady people wearing a hat and a long coat, that's called a duster, they're wearing a duster and a cat, and they went to Coca-Cola and said, I have a secret for you that's going to make your beverages really good and compete with Coca-Cola. Now, the CEO of Pepsi uh, didn't like that idea. It comes, okay, I'm going to tell you this thing on based on two things, confidentiality and integrity. Now, that guy was clearly breaching the confidentiality of its employer. He went to Coca-Cola. He said, okay, fine, let's have a meeting. The CEO of Pepsi said to that guy. Now, that guy took the formula, went there, sat on the conference table a few minutes later. Now, he's breaching what confidentiality? A few minutes later, the CEO of, CEO of Pepsi came with the CEO of, of, CEO of Coca-Cola and they reported him saying that we do not want your formula, we want to be straightforward and honest in all professional relationships. We are competitors, we are not enemies, that's integrity. Now CEO of Pepsi showed integrity but the employee of Coca-Cola did not show integrity or confidentiality. I find this example really cool. I don't know about you guys. Finally, we come to professional behavior. Now, as for a long time, I've been waiting to tell you guys about this example. It's a really cool example about professional behavior is to act professionally outside of your profession as well. And refrain from any conduct which might bring discreet to your profession. So don't do anything bad that gives a negative image to your profession. Like your parents say, don't do anything to insult us, don't do anything to embarrass us. You know, you, when you're connected to someone, they are worried about their own reputation. If they trust you, they still are scared, you know, just they wanted you to be on your best behavior all the time. Same thing goes for ACCA. ACCA gave you a certificate claiming that you're a member of them, and then you go on and do a lot of bad things, things get ugly. ACC doesn't want to be a part of that. If I have a cousin who is a drug addict, I would try not to bring him up to my friends or to anybody in the near future. Right? I'm sure everybody has the same problem going on. Now, professional behavior. I'll give you one example. Just for, I know you guys know what it is, but I just want to give you an example, you know, just to, just to have a bit fun with you guys here. Now, professional behavior, basically, uh, what happened a few decades ago, uh, um, uh, an audit partner in KPMG used to take a train from Manchester to London and one time he <clears throat> was a bit late and uh, he ran inside now okay what happens in England is that there's there are tokens that you need to buy 
and then finally you just need to uh, buy the token you can get inside you just get inside you just buy the token of the place you want to go to you get inside and when you're coming out you just put the token in there and that's it you don't really have to do anything you just put the token at your destination and bam it works actually the same thing pretty much the same thing over here in Malaysia so I understand what it is I hope you guys understand the same concept so you can enter without anything but you have to exit with, with a valid token okay now he was a bit late so he left without taking a token and he got in the train now he knew that uh, the other train is gonna come in after a very long time and he will be very he will be late to work and stuff like that so he just took the train and without a token so nothing happened that day he when he went when he reached his destination he was quite happy that he's he's on time and everything is okay so when he went to the counter the customer service and said sorry I was running late the train was already there I couldn't take the token so could you please give me the token so I can get out of the station and she asked him the customer service person he or she whoever it was and uh, no sexism there they asked him uh, which station did you get from instead of saying Manchester he said one station before London he only paid a pound to travel otherwise he would have to pay about 10 pounds or 9 pounds or something now he's saving quite a few bucks there you know he's saving quite a few sterlings I don't know how many 10, 8, 9, 10, let's say 10 sterlings he's saving 10 pounds every time he's taking the train he liked it he liked the idea he said that's a very good idea I can save 10 pounds every day 20 pounds every day you know a round trip meaning 20 pounds a day that's a huge amount for me he got greedy his professional behavior went in the dark he started doing that on a regular basis a few days passed by and there are obviously there in England there are CCTV cameras literally everywhere like they are everywhere England is famous for CCTV cameras they are everywhere now what happened with the CCTV cameras that they saw him uh, taking the train from Manchester but claiming that he's taking a train from one station before London uh, people the, the police got involved in it and they knew that something is wrong so what happened was that one day they caught him they, uh, they confronted him and uh, they found out what happened they reported him to the police there was a big fuss about it people got really uh, uh, he got really embarrassed his ACC membership was taken he was thrown out of partnership from KPMG and well let's just say he had a bad ending so that's why you shouldn't have let go of your professional behavior no matter what happens right uh, there are exam questions and everything. We'll do these things. Don't worry about it. We'll talk about these things in a lot more detail. Uh, okay, uh, you can dis you, There are times when you have to disclose your employer's private or confidential information. Now you're bound to confidentiality unless there are these kind of things. There's treason. There is terrorism. There's drug trafficking. There's money laundering. These kind of things are really alarming and they don't just affect one person, they affect the whole nation. They're very, very, very critical things. So when these type of things happen, you need to report them. Report how, like I said, if you have life and life threats, you're not allowed to talk. Like for in China, there is no Facebook, there is nothing literally in that country. Uh, and the government is controlling most of it. North Korea is one of the coolest examples I like to give. I've, I've been studying about that fascinating country. They held captive. They are holding literally everybody in their country captive. They, are, they don't have passports. They cannot work uh, whatever they want to work as. They're not given proper education. That country is really a prison. It's a prison for everybody. They'll kill you if you talk about your bad about your country. Now, the problem is, those people need to report some stuff of, stuff as well. They go to the deep web, like I told you, the deep web, the dark web, whatever you're gonna call it, to report whistleblowing. In Saudi Arabia, it happens. In Dubai, in Dubai, you cannot have a VPN. You know what a VPN is? It will change your IP address. So now, for example, I'm surfing this from. Let's say I'm gonna type Google here let's uh, okay I'll just type google.com 
Okay, it just came as it is because I'm trying to hide my identity. But Spice Rider right, is supposed to come like this. It's good Google Malaysia that's supposed to come, right? But otherwise, if you're in Pakistan, it will come as google.com.pk, that's Pakistan, right? So, in those countries, you're not allowed to use VPN. Now, VPN will change your IP address to, I don't know, Russia, to, 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 from Dubai, it will change to Russia, to India, to Australia. It will keep changing it constantly so people can track you down. So, um, what happened is that UAE has blocked that. UAE is very consistent about these things as well. So if you want to disclose something and you have a life-threatening situation, you can whistleblow. Uh, see, you are protecting members' interest. You are having a legal process. This may require legal. And there, if there is a public interest, for example, something is going on that's not good for the public, you do that. So these are certain things, except for these very important things, there are certain important things that you might have to take in charge, take care of them as well. And disclose your members' confidential, disclose your people's confidentiality or clients' confidentiality. Let's talk about threats. There's a okay. I like this. I like this threat thing. You know, I always used to remember this as F A S S I. Uh, please come in one page. I seriously don't know if I can zoom it out. Oh, I can zoom it out. I can zoom it out. Okay, F A S S I. Fassy, Fossy, whatever you want to call it. That's my, my mnemonic of remembering how it works. Now, Fassy basically uh, is talking about self-interest. Now, you need to make sure you don't have any self-interest in your client. We'll talk a lot more about this when you're talking about engagements and everything because then they'll discuss with you how much fees that you're supposed to charge, how much it's supposed to be and stuff like that, okay? Now, self-interest basically means that you have a personal interest, personal gain from the client and if that's the case, you might impair your objectivity and independence. You might be scared. Now, if you're working for your employer, let's say you have, you have a job, okay? You think you'll talk, you talk back at your boss? He's paying you. You just say to him, you go from here, you SOB. You think he'll, in, he'll appreciate it? No. <laughs> He's going to throw you out of work. You have a self-interest of keeping the job to have the money to survive in this world, right? Now, that's one of the reasons I'm saying that the auditor may have a financial interest, but they shouldn't. A self-reviewed threat. A self refuse trust is basically just talking about you preparing the financial statement and then auditing them, like the same people. That is actually a threat to objectivity because you don't, you can't be objective to yourself and independence. For example, you're sitting alone and you plan on, I don't know, eating a lot of chocolates. Now, chocolate is not good for your health. You bought it, now you want to eat it. Or, or let's say drugs. Drugs sounds more, um, they sound worse, you know. You want to do drugs. Self-review. You think you're going to criticize yourself about it? I don't think so. Nobody criticizes themselves. I mean, if you're really that good to criticize and win from your own self, that's really a level, you know. But it doesn't work that way, buddy. Advocacy is basically when you're, when you're justifying the position of your client and you are actually coming out on their behalf that also will affect your objectivity at one point you're let's say there's a court case going on and your firm is representing your client and you're auditing the client at the same time now at, in the court you're saying that for the client is actually innocent in the audit report you're giving a qualified opinion that's a contradiction mate you can't do that then you get in trouble avoid that intimidation is where the client really scares you not because they're scary maybe because if they will fire you you will lose a lot of your money you'll lose a lot of your income or worse they are really scaring you for life they're threatening you they say if you do anything except to give a fair true and fair view you guys are going down come on I mean Sounds scary to me. And finally, there's a familiarity thread. Let's say your the accounts manager is 
your brother or your sister or your father. Now, it's actually a closed relative, but let's say you are the father in the audit firm and your child is the, is the accounts manager in that firm or the finance manager in that, uh, in your, as a client. Uh, it's still okay. The other way around will be worse. Let's say your father is the finance manager in, the, in your client's company and you are auditing your father's company, then it might be a bit of a problem. We'll do a question on this, you guys will understand more about it. And in fact, there are a lot of uh, examples here, small examples that I would want you to read. For example, the gifts, the gifts and hospitality, uh, hospitality and stuff like that. Uh, just read them through, let me know if you have anything. It's a very uh, important topic, all right? You will get a question, you might get a question from this. You may not, but you might, all right? <coughs> Okay, you're, there are typical threats, okay? Holding shares in a client, obviously there's a self-interest threat. Uh, read it, all right? Just, they're just examples. There's a significant income from client, let's say you're, okay, this is the limit. Limit the amount to 10% of total fee if it's a listed company and 15% if it's an unlisted company. So don't charge them more than 10%. Now, what's the 10% of your annual income, okay? If you're earning $1 million a year, don't charge them 100,000, more than 100,000 a year. Simple. Separate business ventures with the client. Don't do that. You can't be associated with the client in any normal way. You're doing a joint venture together and you're auditing the client. No, don't work like that. And don't give a loan to the client. And don't get a loan from the client either. I mean, unless it's a bank. Lowballing is fine. But make sure the work is done appropriately. And it lowballing doesn't mean to do it every time. It's just a starting price. Like I, I, I'll teach you guys. I'll say, okay, I'll teach you guys for free once. And the next time, if you want to study, I'll charge you guys this much money. That's lowballing, right? That's setting a very low fee or literally nothing to attract new people and then ensuring that I'll get more work in the future. Not the concept of what I'm, why I'm doing this, but just sounded like a good example. Don't take me wrong, okay? Then there are safeguards. So it's a, even though the fees is less, based on the predetermined work forever required, make sure you work proper. Sometimes when you don't get enough money, you just don't become, you don't just feel very confident anymore and you don't feel like really excited to do that work, right? Money really is a motivator to a lot of people. Hospitali hospitality and benefits don't accept them. Contingent fee, okay. Audit fees are not to be determined in this way. You are not allowed to charge contingent fee, ever. No questions asked. In the exam, if they say there's a contingent fee, say that that's wrong. Never, ever charge contingent fee. Are we good there? And then accounting services. If you want to provide accounting services, make sure there's a Chinese wall. Chinese wall meaning that there are two different separate teams working as doing the work and doing the accounting and audit separately to two different people. Uh, audit firm level, you need to train people and you need to do some quality control procedures. We'll talk a lot more of this in quality control section of the for, of the syllabus. Uh, okay, we're talking about safeguards to independence and everything, right? Training, train them to not get involved. It's a very bad idea to get involved with the people who are auditing you. Like, if they come here in the accounts, they are the auditors, you get you, you can get attracted to them. You know, that's one of the examples. Very common example. Don't, I'll just recommend you don't do that because they are account, they're doing accounting, right? Let's say they are, they did the accounts and then there's something wrong in it, but then you're, you feel like something's going on there. You might have, you might have a chance with that person. You don't want to ruin it bringing up those problems, small problems. Do you understand? Like a lot of people, a lot of cool people say don't poop where you eat, is that where it applies. Do not get physically or, uh, or emotionally attached with people whom you're working for or you're working with. Then there are quality control procedures uh, to make sure the independence is considered in all work levels performed. T train people, let them know what's the appropriate level of the role. If they should come out and say, hey, I can't work here because uh, my fiance is actually the accounts manager, so I don't think I'll, I'll be really independent here. Can you please change my team? 
You need to have consultations. You need to lay out all the, you need to make sure everything is fine. You need to tell them about ethical codes. You need to have internal controls to make sure if people are hiding things, they know what's going on. The profession. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I just smiled because I saw a smiley face over here. It made me smile. Now, the professional need to take a disciplinary action and appropriate. Now, professional secretary, regulatory practices. Now, you have to rotate. Audit must be compulsory. You know, every, every every five years, you need to change your audit. You have you choose audit committees. Talk to those people. Do take your ACC exam and please, once you become a member, do the CPDs as well. I know it sounds boring and it sounds worthless, but it's fun. It's it's nice actually. And then there's corporate governance and of course the like auditing standard that you need to take care of. And in today's, I'll just read them through. I don't think there's anything I need to explain over here. Now, how to resolve an ethical issue. When the auditor is suspicious of an ethical threat, action must be taken. For example, you have to assess the fact, you have to consider ethical issues, and you need to take care of these things. So seriously, I don't really uh, understand why we need to say this is like common sense, okay? You have to resign at the end. I think we have talked about resigning before too. If I'm not mistaken, this should be the last. No, there's one more. Okay, fine. <clears throat> Conceptual framework. It works like this. You have to identify the threat that may cause a fundamental principle to be broken. For example, what are the principles we talked about? Confidentiality, you know, pick up. We talked about pick up. That's your fundamental principles, right? <clears throat> the fundamental principle, how likely it's to be broken? The English is, it's, it's actually painful to say this out loud. How likely is it to be broken? How likely is the fundamental principle to be broken? I mean, that's the, that's the best I can come up with this sentence. I don't know how he wrote it. But anywho, that's not a point. We're not talking about English exams over here. We're talking about the fundamental principles and how likely they're going to be broken. Like, do you think they'll be broken? I suppose. For example, there's a self-review thread or there's a familiarity thread. Your fiancé is working. You think you'll break your engagement just to make sure there's nothing going on in there? No, I don't think so. They're never going to do that. That's so unreal and in a bad way. And limit the risk if there are more threats and to an acceptable level. So just make sure the threats are limited. And if they're not, you might not even take that client. Uh, there are three types of safeguards which limit the risk. That's the profession. You need to study, passing your exams, understanding ethics. Uh, talking about legislation, how to become a good auditor, having corporate governance regulations set out, stuff like that, you know, educating yourself, that's what it is. Uh, as an individual level, you need to do your, C you need to do your CPD, you need to uh, contact ACC for further guidance on this matter. Actually, this part over here is not important to your exam, it's just a kind of a thing that you will... How can I tell you what it is? Marketing scheme, you know? that we are so worried that our people are ethical. I'm ACC and I'm worried I need to teach my students to be ethical. You know, something like that, to tell the world that we are good people. So just read them through, guys. It's not really a big deal. Trust me on this. <clears throat> uh, okay, I told you skepticism. In the previous lecture, I told you what skepticism is. We, basically, people from Pakistan are gifted of negativity and we are very good skeptics we are good in skepticism right we are very skeptical people uh, I actually prefer writing skeptical with a K these people write it with a C uh, you do whatever you like I'd stick with K read it through <laughs> I'll I have explained skepticism to you guys before so I think when you listen to the previous lecture you'll already know about it and there are some examples over here. If you still need any uh, further discussions on this, do let me know and I'll help you out there as well, okay? Okay, this is the last slide, just wanted to make sure. Now professional skepticism and judgment. Now when you're planning and performing an audit, uh, you need to have professional skepticism. Now how would you have professional skepticism? You need to make sure when is there sufficient evidence? You know, you need to have personal judgments in the planning and performing of audit. Like, how much evidence do you need to require? What's the quality of the evidence? Do you think a management representation letter would be enough? We'll talk about audit uh, evidence and audit procedures very soon. But just stick with me over here. Just, just assume you know all of it, alright? What kind of evidence do you need? 
Is it need to be consistent with something? Do you need to recheck it? Like bank statements you take from the client and then you do a bank confirmation. Are the assumptions reasonable? If you go to inventory, they're doing LIFO. Do you think that's acceptable? That's reasonable? No. You need to do FIFO or weighted average. They're right. Then there are factors that needs judgment are like how serious the risk is. The inventory is for $10 and you're fighting with the management for 10 days to reclassify it as $9. No, don't do that. That's not worth it. We'll talk about materiality, then you'll know. What? Okay, that's the second point. Materiality of the item. So that depends on how much time you're going to spend on it. Materiality matters, all right? The strength of internal control. So if the internal control, we'll talk about the audit formula as well. The audit, the audit risk equals to the three different types of inherent control and detection risks. And we'll talk about that internal control in um, control risks, okay? And the sampling matters. What type of methods are we going to use? What kind of things? And we'll talk about these later as well, okay? Thank you very much for listening. And I think I'm going to stop recording here. It's been a very long time as well. Um, and I think the next time I'm going to come up with fraud and error, uh, it's, it's going to be fun too. I hope you guys liked this. I hope you guys understood whatever I told you. And if you still have any co uh, confusion on any specific topic or whatever we covered today, please do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you very much. And I hope you guys have a great day.